started to record. Thank you, you know, very much, you know, for uh, for your patience. Um, so I'll, I'll give a, a short you know, introduction. I mean, many of you will be familiar with uh, Lena Vasquez. She's uh, not just a polyglot, but also a YouTuber, and she's also um, an expert on holistic uh, language learning. And your know, holistic learning is part of the uh, the um, it's what this conference you know is about. And also, um, you know, one one thing if you watch some of her videos where she speaks in different languages, like you know, she's not she doesn't just speak the language well, but with a very good accent as well. So when uh, so I, I definitely check out you know her her, her, her stuff on, on on YouTube. So you know, whenever you're ready, please fire away. Uh, right. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And hello, everybody. It is such a pleasure to be here. And I'm incredibly excited to present something to you that I don't think has ever actually existed in this space and in the world of languages, which is my domain. So what if I told you that the way that you see the world is actually an illusion? that the way that we think about science and language is actually also an illusion, that the separateness that exists isn't actually there, and that the way that you have been taught throughout your life to see languages or yourself as a learner is also an illusion. So today in this talk, my greatest hope for you is to look at the world a little bit differently, to look at the domains of science and language differently and see something that you may have never seen before. And most importantly, what I hope that you take away from my talk today is some questions, some ideas about yourself as a learner and potentially some answers or at least resources to find answers for challenges you may have had when it comes to learning a language. So if you can, close your eyes for a moment. Now I know that I can't see you all, but just close your eyes and imagine the world. So what do you see? Just think about the world. Now you can open your eyes. And I don't know about you, but when I have to think about the world, the first thing that comes to my mind is a map. A map which has all of the continents with their respective names, the countries, the cities. But the reality is that these words and these names for places don't actually exist in nature, right? We as human beings put them there. And we can think about these words as a representation as a representation of language here, right? And so if we remove the place names, we're still left with countries that are divided up by borders and lines, right? So for example, if you're in Lancaster at the moment in England, and you went to, to a map where you were you know, driving and you saw Google Maps, you would say, all right, here's the border, here's Lancaster, then we got Preston, then we got other places, you know? But the truth is that we put the lines there. And so think about these lines and this kind of compartmentalization of the world as representing science, right? So having science and having language Having these these words for places and having these borders helps us to actually navigate the world, right? If we didn't have the place names, it would be very hard for you to tell me where you were right now. And if we didn't have the lines and, you know, the compartmentalization of the world, it would be quite difficult for us to handle global affairs in the way that they function these days. But the truth is that the world doesn't actually look that way, right? 
and we can think of a closer depiction of the world as being something like a little bit like this image here. So if you see, this is a still image, yes, but there are no lines, there are no borders, there are no place names, it just is. And if you were to go outside, for example, and I asked you to, you know, to drive up to the border between Wales and England, for example, and tell me, right, can you, can you tell me where Wales is and can you tell me where England is? I think it would be very difficult for you to do so. And same thing if, for example, you went to where I'm from, which is Australia, and I told you, hey, can you, can you come to the ocean border here and tell me where does the sea actually start and where does Australia start? It would be impossible because the waves are always moving and the sand is there and we just can't draw a line. And so we can think a little bit about this connection between science, language and nature as being something also related to another concept. You can think about it as being like the bees and the flowers in the world. Now, what does a flower actually need to, to grow? Now, I'm no biologist, but I think, you know, some of the standard things are it needs fertile soil, it needs sunshine, water. Those are kind of the main things, right? But there is actually something that is incredibly important to the survival and the growth of a flower and that is bees. The only reason why most of the flowers that exist in the world today are still here, and the reason why so many types of plants still exist that have flowers, is because of bees. They would not be here if it wasn't for the cross-pollination of bees, right? And so we have them to thank as well, because bees and their, their pollination is the reason why a lot of the fruits and vegetables that we eat actually still exist. If they weren't here, we'd probably have a hard time nourishing ourselves. But there's an even more important connection here. And it's that bees actually can't survive without flowers. They need the nectar from flowers for their own growth. And so you can see this relationship as a symbiosis, right? It's not that flowers are more important than the bees. It's not that bees are more important than the flowers. They function like this. It's an, a unified field. It's a unified relationship. And so the key thing I really want to bring to the forefront here is that it's the same thing with science and language. It's actually not the case that science is that different to language or language is that different in terms of their value. It's that just like the bees and the flowers, they are in a symbiosis. They need each other. And you're probably wondering now, well, how so, right? What is it about language and science? Why do they need each other? Well, if we think about what the definition actually is of science, and what the definition is of language, we can see that they actually have some commonalities, some intersection. So science, if you go and look in the dictionary, is defined as something along the lines of being the pursuit and the application of knowledge and understanding about the natural world, right? And done so in a systematic manner. So the key words here that I want you to, to notice are it's about knowledge and understanding. How can you have knowledge and understanding without having language? Right? And the same thing goes for language. Language is the primary means of communication for us as human beings, right? It's done so in a structured and conventional way and is represented through words, just like how I'm speaking to you right now, but it's also done so in writing and gesture. And so what you might have noticed in this definition of language as well is the key point of in a structured manner. 
Now, sometimes we may think, well, does language really have structure to it? But it does, right? That's why the study of linguistics exists. And if we didn't have structure in language, it would be very hard to actually teach foreign languages and to learn them. Now, notice I didn't say it would be impossible because, of course, you know, the development of linguistics has evolved and we were able to communicate for thousands of years before that without this kind of modern domain of science, or as, as we know it today. But language essentially needs science. It evolves with science. And the same thing goes for science. Science evolves with our language because what is science actually? I mean, I just gave you the definition, but think about it. Science starts always with a question, with a hypothesis, right? And how can you have a question without language? So another important thing that I wanna, wanna mention here is Think about if you're a scientist or even if you're just if you're interested in the world or if you've ever asked a question like one that I think is is in the minds of every human being, which is why do I exist? Who am I and why am I here? Right? I mean, we are so interested in finding out everything about the universe that we possibly can. Right? Science began with these questions of, of natural philosophy. And it's interesting if you notice that science used to be called natural philosophy until the meaning changed somewhere in the 17th century. But it starts essentially with asking this question of, well, looking around and saying, why am I here? Why does this bee exist? Why does this flower exist? Right? And so if we're asking questions about the universe, and we're asking questions about the world. And finally, we ask the question about ourselves. It's important to notice that these questions will always be limited by the frame of mind of your language. So for example, if you notice, I asked this question in English, right? And the English language, just based on its structure, needs to have a subject, a verb, and then usually an object. So in simpler terms, I can't actually ask a question or really say anything in English without needing to put myself somewhere in this picture or to put something that I can directly see, a noun, an object, right? Or to have a subject in that phrase. And the truth is that this is actually the case for all the languages in the world, the way that they have developed has come with needing this structure, with needing to have a noun and a verb and a subject. Now, the only exception or slight exception to this rule is Indonesian, where you can have a sentence, for example, as the sentence of um, I eat fried rice, right, where we can, the way that it's constructed, it says something like eat fry rice me. But still, we need to have a structure. And so the question I want to pose here is, how do you think science would work? Or what questions could we be asking ourselves about the world if our language wasn't limited by this concept of the structure of the noun and the verb and the subject. Now, I don't have the answer, but I think it's a very interesting question to just ponder about. And when we're talking about this, this perspective, right? So I mentioned that language really influences the way that we see the world. And we're not even aware of it, right? I think it's, it's such a mind blowing thing to think about, man, what if I did speak in a different way? How would I see the world if I wasn't limited by this, this way of, of having a subject and a verb and, and an object in my, linguistic, in my linguistic paradigm? And what was interesting to me upon reflection is, like I said, not all languages do this, right? And one of those examples 
it actually comes from my native language, which is Latvian. So I mentioned that I was from Australia, but I was actually born in Latvia and I grew up between the two places. So in Latvia, we have a really tight connection with nature. So a lot of our cultural holidays that we have are actually in alignment with the movements of the sun. So for example, we have a holiday called Yani, which actually just passed and it's in June, between June 21st and June 23rd, and it celebrates the summer solstice. And in Latvian, we actually don't have a word or a, a concept or a way of saying it, right? So when I look, and I talk about the trees and the flowers and the bees. When I do so in Latvian, Latvian. I actually am calling, actually them, calling he them he and she, and, she. And, and they, and the characteristics that we give them are very personable. So I know that there are many languages that you know have this, this concept of gender, like Spanish and German. But the thing about Latvian, whereas in German you can say es, so for example, es ist, we don't actually have that in Latvian. As I said, everything is personable. And so, do you think that there could be a connection between the fact that languages that developed to take care of nature and really hold nature as something, you know, that is connected to us, that that influenced the way that the language developed, that that influenced this, this Person of like personification in the grammatical structure itself. Something interesting to think about. Because if we look at it, in most of the Western world in particular, the way that language developed has actually a, a deeper connection to nature. So the thing about English, for example, how it developed, right? Is that we, when we look at necessity and we think about not just English, actually, I wanna, I wanna broaden this a little bit and talk about the languages of, of as I said, the most of the Western world. They developed because there started to be this, this need, right? For, for survival to be able to name, well, what is, where is the potential danger? What is happening? Right? Language develops a lot of the time out of necessity. And at some point, if we go thousands of years back, what happened in the Western world was we actually used to have a connection um, in terms of religion to paganism. And for those of you who don't know, paganism celebrates or a lot of the rituals and the traditions that are, are tied to paganism um, are actually to do with nature. And then at some point this shifted, right? And other religious contexts played a huge role. And man was now put here, above nature, above everything. So what did this do to the perception of reality? I think we can see a pretty clear picture in the world today that we see ourselves, a lot of us, as human beings being above nature and above animals. And as I said, this has a really deep root in, in religious context because it said that nature and animals were made to serve man, right? And this actually developed further and leaked into other spheres of, of the world that we know today, such as science. Now, a lot of you may be familiar with René Descartes. And it was actually René Descartes, the French philosopher, who started to, to kind of propagate that nature and man were separate, that man was above nature. And for those of you who, who may not know René Descartes, you may know him for being the person that coined the phrase, I think, therefore I am. So, this idea of man being above nature started to, to seep into his philosophy, right? And so he said basically also that the mind was separate from the body, which is something I'm gonna to touch on a little bit later down the track. 
But it's interesting to consider these historical contexts and ask ourselves the question, well, wow, so at some point in my language and in my history, there was this notion, this disconnection that came from nature and from me as a human being and my connection to it, right? And so it's also interesting to ask ourselves, well, is this really true? Do humans need nature? Does nature need humans? I'm going to let you answer that for yourself. Because the reality is that our connection to nature, just as the bees and the flowers, is also there. There are processes that are happening with us and everything around us and happening within us as well that we cannot necessarily see, but they are there because we see the outcomes of it. And this idea that René Descartes brought forward about, you know, I think, therefore I am, and this idea that we, that anything valid in the world needs to have a logical explanation to it. So just as I actually started with my talk about giving you the definition of science and language, this is what René Descartes essentially said is necessary. We need to be able to define everything we see in the world. We need to be able to have a logical explanation. Otherwise, it's not valid. Now, the question that comes to my mind is, well, thinking about, for example, one of the greatest experiences of my life, which was giving birth to my son a few months ago, right? Anytime I think about this experience, tears well up in my eyes like right now. And the feelings come and I think about that moment. There is no word, no phrase in any of the seven languages that I speak that could tell you what that experience was like. There is no way. I can't describe to you the feelings or hearing his cry for the first time. Now, do you want to tell me that that experience now isn't valid because I can't have a quantitative analysis of it? And this is important to also note for when it comes to language, right? As I said, it's not about science being above language or being able to quantify everything that makes it more valid or that the fact that, you know, these experiences we have or the language that we speak, if it doesn't have a rule, then it's also not valid. It's that we need both. We need both. Because without science in language, as I said, it would be very difficult for us to actually understand the world. The biggest reason why we can, we can have, for example, this conversation here and see each other or connect with each other live is because of the development of science, right? And the same goes for language. We need to have this freedom, this spontaneity, this expression that comes with just being. Because that is also our truest nature. And as I said, we can't have one without the other. And what's interesting to think about is. In the Western world, as I said, we have this this idea that unless we can actually quantify something and put it into a description with words. It's not valid. But what we have seen actually in recent developments in science also, particularly in the field of psychology, is that things that, for example, have been known in the yogic sciences about mindfulness and meditation for thousands of years are only now in, you know, in this sphere of, of 2022 and in the recent years, coming to the forefront saying, hey, you know what? There actually is a connection between all this breathing and this, these, these, you know, spiritual practices and our well-being and our function as humans. And another thing to note is that when we look at, for example, the Oriental world, in China, for example, thousands of years ago, in Taoism, they found that 
or was the root of Taoism. They found that everything in the world functioned in a complementary binary manner. And this is actually where binary numbers came from. It was years ago from the ancient Chinese philosophy of looking at the world and seeing that everything has a complementarity to it. You know, it's like, think about, you can't understand happiness really without having experienced sadness. You can't really understand pleasure without understanding pain. And so the same thing goes for science and language that we need both of these realms. And I'm almost hesitant to say both because as I said, just like the bees and the flowers, they're actually in one relationship together, right? And so we see this also, this development with the binary numbers in the language of the Chinese, right? And it's just important to, to think about it or interesting to think about it, that if we look at Chinese and their connection to nature, it's very different to the Western world. See, in Taoism, there are these, these two ideas about the way that we see the world. There's conventional knowledge, which is kind of what you can think about as what I mentioned earlier about being able to think logic reason. And this turns into that conventional knowledge, right? But there's also a deeper layer, which is about knowledge that is in the body in feeling, in just this, this knowing that you can't actually pinpoint. And this is how, you know, think about it. If this has been around for thousands of years, how deeply entrenched it is in the way that, that people see the world. And the question I just want to put forward is, how would we see the world? What types of questions would we ask if it wasn't for the structures of the language that exists today. The language that, that you speak and I speak, or even the languages, right? As I mentioned, all of them have developed with this similar structure of needing to have us as the center, of not being able to describe the world without having a, a subject there. And the thing as well is science, everything that we actually know in the field of science is predominantly in English or the research predominantly has been done in English. But this doesn't actually cover the majority of the world. English is just one language out of approximately seven and a half thousand. So what other things would we be able to discover about us as human beings, about the world that we live in and about the universe, if the language that we did science in, the language that we ask questions in, was not English, but started to shift and we allowed other languages, other people from other countries to ask these questions. And if we came together and we learned languages, how would that shift your perspective? And I can tell you this, that for me, every language that I learned and the languages that I continue to learn have helped me become the person that I am today. And they've helped me realize that the more that I know, the more I actually don't know. And the more that I try to ask myself, who am I? I kind of get a little bit of a different response when it comes to thinking, for example, in Latvian or thinking in Spanish or thinking in Portuguese. So think about that. If you could see the world in a language that wasn't one of the ones you speak right now, or if the languages that we had were structured a little bit differently, such as, for example, the neurophysicist um, sorry, <laughs> theoretical physicist um, David Baum actually purported, he put forward this question that, um, well, what if we change language completely, right? And he started to come up with this rhodiard language and said, well, what if instead of needing to have this noun and this verb, we actually focused 
on the verb, on the action, on the movement. And we do see some signs of this in, in the Chinese language where you can have a noun and a verb that kind of have a, um, a similar, you know, standing in the language. So to summarize what we've talked a little bit about today, we looked at the illusion in the world, right? When I asked you to think about planet Earth and how you see it, right? And it's necessary that we have, I guess, this compartmentalization um, of being able to just name one thing at a time and think one thought at a time. But it's important to remember that the world doesn't function that way. Right now, in this very moment on the Earth, there are so many different processes happening also to you and me. For example, we are constantly aging. But if I told you to show me the signs of aging, well, you'd be like, I don't know, maybe you have a wrinkle here, a wrinkle there, but we can't see it, but we know it's happening. And then, as I said, we can look at this connection also between science and language of this illusion or the separateness being an illusion, just like the bees and the flowers. The bees and the flowers are in a symbiosis. They need each other. They are always functioning like this. It's not this above that or the other way around. And I talked a little bit about the perspective, the perception about the world based on the language that we speak. And the key question that I want to put forward is not one necessarily to be answered right now, but just something to kind of sit and, and really reflect on is how is the language that I'm speaking influencing my way of being and my way of seeing the world? And could there potentially be other languages, if I were to learn them or even explore them a little bit, that could help me see the world a little bit differently? And the way that our language has developed is thanks to, for a, a great part of it, to René Descartes, who developed rationalism, this idea of, of everything needing to be logical and that knowledge was only really sound if we could, you know, give it a meaning, if we could put it into words. And finally, we also looked at the fact that, well, yes, in the Western world, we a lot of our language and the way that we see the world has, was thanks to that and thanks to the development of this field of rationalism, but it doesn't exist everywhere in the world. And we see that in cultures such as in China, that nature in this kind of closer depiction of reality of how of our connection to the world is seen in the way that it's developed. It's seen in roots of Taoism and that the binary numbers that created code, for example, actually come from nature. So there also exists another important area where there is an illusion of separateness. And that is when it comes to the field of learning and learning languages. So a lot of you may be familiar with this concept of, of there being a right-brained and a left-brained person. Right. I don't know if you've if you're if you're anything like me and you've done one of those quizzes that sometimes comes up on Facebook about, oh, you know, which way is this person turning or which way is the person turning, um, you know, and, and that somehow gives you a definition of, of which brain is your most, which side of the brain, which hemisphere of the brain is the most predominant one. Right. Um, or those quizzes that take you through multiple questions and they tell you, all right, you're more of a left brain person, a right brain person. Now, this is extremely fun to do because we all love to find out something about ourselves, right? But unfortunately, I have to tell you that this idea of there being a left brain and a right brain person is actually a myth. The brain doesn't, doesn't split in that way. Both sides of the hemisphere, regardless of, you know, if we're talking about the linguistics, which is kind of known to be more in the right side of the brain, versus, you know, kind of mathematical, analytical knowledge, which is said to be more left side of the brain. 
It's not true. The brain doesn't function in a compartmentalized way. There is a corpus callosum in the center, which always draws the connections, right? And what's also important to, to note is that neuroscientists themselves have actually said that we only know something like 10% about the brain. We know how brains form or our brain forms the connections, but we don't actually know why. We don't know how we actually also process knowledge. So thinking about this, I think is important because when we think about learning, we see that predominantly in this space of learning languages, everything is to do with the mind, right? The mind kind of gets put on a pedestal, but the mind is only one part of learning. And I want to give you kind of a simple example to clarify this thought. Think about yourself, right? Can you tell me where learning actually happens? I know that I can't. I'm really tempted to point to the mind and the brain, but we can't pinpoint when learning happens or where it happens. And even in our language, the way I described it was, okay, you and learning. But it's not like that. It's not that you are here and learning is here and you somehow, you know, let's say that this represents learning a language. You go, oh, let me just go catch that and like put it as a chip in my head or something. Doesn't function that way. You are the learning. And what are you? Right? Some of the processes or, or the simple ways that we can, what we can put forward here is, well, you're not just the brain, you, you're not just the brain or the mind, you also have consciousness. You are also your physical body. And everything that goes into your physical body is also to do with you and actually affects your learning process. If you had a coffee this morning or one in your break, that's going to also affect your learning process and your ability to take information in, right? And learning is also, it consists of kind of two parts, two basic parts, which is, you know, being exposed to, to something, having an experience of information and memorizing it and keeping it in your memory and retaining it and then being able to also kind of express it afterwards. And our memory process is also affected by everything. It's not just about having the best technique that is, let's say, about you know writing down things or whatever. This is just one small aspect of the potential that you have as a human being to learn and to learn a language. And so we can think about this as what I call holistic learning and holistic language learning. So holistic language learning is employing the mind, the body, your emotions, and your energy to reach the highest potential or unlock the highest potential of you as a learner. And this is extremely important because when you understand that your learning process, everything affects everything, you can start to ask better questions and just kind of zoom out a little bit and see, well, what if the way that I'm eating is affecting my learning. You know, when you eat something heavy before, for example, a class or you go to learn something, your brain is going to spend about 40% of its energy just in digestion. So you've just kind of taken away a huge part of the energy you could have had for learning. And I also mentioned emotions and energy. As a holistic language learning coach, I can tell you some of the biggest issues I have seen in, or let's say challenges, I've seen in my learners when they come to me and they say, you know what, Lena, I really want to learn German. I've been struggling with this. A lot of their issues have actually had nothing to do with the language itself or the process. It's not that they haven't yet found this best method of learning for them. It's that they don't understand themselves as a learner yet. 
And most importantly, one of the biggest things that I can, I think gets underlooked in this space is the fact that there are other things from all aspects of your life that really affect your learning, such as the limiting beliefs that you have, right? As I said, one of the biggest challenges I've seen is that they don't understand themselves as a learner, yes, but it goes deeper to they don't know some of the blocks to learning that they picked up in early childhood even. You know, this idea, you probably heard this from, from people when you ask them, you know, oh, do you speak Spanish or do you speak this language? When they tell you that, hey, I'm learning Spanish, they say, oh, yeah, but I don't yet speak it. Or yeah, but I'm not that good. Or my English is not that good. My Spanish is not that good. Where does this come from? What does it even mean to speak a language well, right? Language is there for communication, for expression of yourself, and it doesn't need to be perfect. And I think that these ideas that we have about, about learning and about, you know, oh, if I, if I can't memorize something, it's got to be to do with the method that I'm using. It's got to be the book that I'm using or the resource. But it's so much more than that. It's so much more. It's about also the limitations that someone else may have placed upon you about how you see the process, right? So for example, this idea of saying that one language is harder than the other, that's also a matter of perspective. I know for myself, I can tell you personally, I never ever allowed myself to even use these words for really saying that, oh, I'm really having a hard time learning this, or I think that this language is really difficult because I knew that the minute that I said that, I made that true. So think about for yourself, where in your life, particularly in your learning process, have you been approaching it in a unidimensional way? When you're learning languages, have you thought about how everything that you eat, everything that you drink, the way that you spend your day, how much stress exists in your life, what your internal and external environment is like, how they affect your learning, how they affect your ability to take in the experience of learning a language, how you see this process. Where else in your life are you viewing it through the lens of seeing yourself as disconnected, as separate from everything around you? Where else in your life are you viewing something unidimensionally where a holistic approach could actually potentially hold the answers to make your challenges a little bit easier? Now, I don't have the answers. These are just questions for you to think about. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Merci, Valdez. Obrigada. Many thanks for that. You touched on many points. I see the connection that you said, what Benny Lewis was saying in his presentation about many limiting beliefs that people tend to have you know, when they uh, approach of learning a language which discourages them before they even start. And I also <clears throat> sympathize a lot with what you say that challenges in learning languages often have nothing to do with the resources or the method by which you're learning the sort of language themselves, but by other factors, both sort of internal and external. Sometimes the uh, um, do we have uh, questions, Felina, in the chat or in the um... Well, maybe I'll start, Lena, with a, uh, a comment made by, by, by Victor Lager. And you were talking about how in Latvia there isn't a word for it. And uh, Victor has written Russian. Well, you, I know you, you speak Russian. Russian personalizes different animal, human, plant, and robotic. And he also mentions, and to be sure, I believe Slavic people are nearer to nature 
than occidental food. So do you have any comment on that? Uh, your new picture. Oh. Uh, now, uh, can you just repeat the last thing you said? Did you mention, I, I think I heard you say Schiller or something. Uh, oh, Schiller, it's not, it's not, oh, the, the last thing I said, uh, Victor has claimed, uh, and to be sure, I believe Slavic people are nearer to nature than possible. Uh, I also have a request, if you're not presenting, please mute your microphone, thanks. Yeah, I thought, I thought that. <laughs> okay. So uh, what, 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 do you, what do you think? You know? Well, yeah, as I said uh, in my presentation, I, I do think that if we look at the way that languages around the world have developed, you will see this correlation between um, cultures that are, are very much tied to nature and seeing nature as being a part of us, also, you know, having that represented in their language or even vice versa, you know, the language that that is being spoken so for example for me in latvian um you see that in latvia 40 percent of of the whole country is actually forest and people really take care of seeing nature as not being separate which also means that we take care of the way that we you know look at things like pollution or the way that we use nature we don't over consume we are really careful that you know everything that we do is kind of part of the natural process. And so I put it forward as just something to think about that it's just an interesting point of, yes, this connection also being seen in the language. And as we know, you know, the, all of our thoughts happen in language for most of us. So that directly correlates to how we see the world and to how we are going to treat the world. And so if we see nature already or the way that we think about it as being separate from us we see what is happening in the world today that you know there is a lot of pollution climate change is happening and so many other issues of that are kind of rooted in overconsumption are happening because of this idea that we are separate so that was kind of the the connection that i wanted to draw from my own personal example with latvian yes uh, yes alina you have a question it's actually like a um, question uh, but because that is quite catch your idea of the of the um, subject and the verb and the and the object because we had a little um, interaction actually uh, right at that point. So uh, because you were saying that there is only one language that does not have this pattern, and I was just a little bit wondering if that is true. Um, but maybe we just didn't catch what you wanted to say. Did you hear me? Could you repeat the last thing you said? It's a little bit echoey for me. I don't know if maybe it's just it's just my audio. Yeah, um, I don't know what you heard, but um, I was just wondering if that is true, like um, that there's only one language that doesn't have this pattern and maybe that we didn't quite catch what you wanted to say because there was this interaction, interaction at that point when you were explaining it. So um, maybe I got it wrong what you wanted to say. Okay, okay. yeah. So I mentioned Indonesian as an example, but honestly also throughout my, my kind of research and things that I've looked at in life, there are definitely other languages that you know have very different structures, particularly indigenous languages. Um, Native American languages, I know of one that I can't quite remember the name right now, but they also have a just a different way of, of structuring their language to be tied or where this noun and, and verb kind of symbiosis is very different. Um, there are things like, for example, in Australia, there are indigenous languages where they, for example, don't have words for you know, left and right. And they see um, everything in the world based on the cardinal directions. So I don't actually know. And I think this would be a beautiful thing um, to explore. Uh, so I'd be, if you wanted to explore it with me, I would love to about, you know, do there exist languages in the world that don't actually have this? So, as I said, and maybe I, I misstated it in my presentation. I can't quite remember if I said there is only one, but there is one that I know of, uh, which was Indonesian that has a slightly different structure. 
So yeah, as I said, I would love to actually know if there if there are any others and what kind of that would what type of influence that would have in the way that we approach the world and thinking about ourselves. Yeah, I, would like I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Intuitively, I would say that um, there are more of those languages that there are that are uh, structured a way like you know in the threesome um, structure. Because, for example, when I was um, in Canada and I come from Finland, um, just the way that I uh, changed the uh, sentence structure was already uh, like. Um, not quite acceptable in English. <laughs> so even, you know, in Finnish it was already right this way. And you have um, languages like, for example, German, where you have to put the verb at the end. And uh, Swedish also has um, like um, a structure that you have to put um, some words in a, in a certain way. But that's like um, in the languages that I know. It's more of an exception than it is the rule. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. I understand what you're saying now about the structure. It's not that uh, languages all have the same structure. That's not what I what I meant to say or I said. It's that kind of the the baseline of sentences or of all the languages, there is this commonality that they need to have, like the, the place that it's coming from is I always or it's about a subject something happening to it or is doing something right so i you know i know of, as a as a german speaker myself that as i can say for example um ich muss blah 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 blah, blah nachmittag is, you know whatever like i can put the verbs at the end or even when it comes to languages like spanish or italian where yes you can you can take away saying yo and for example i can say um, voy a la casa. I'm going home instead of yo voy a la casa. But still, this the boy still has me as a part of it, right? So, as I said, I don't have the answers, but I just think it's an incredible thing to think about that the way that language has developed through history is out of necessity for our survival and of being able to express the things that we need to express, which then becomes rooted in this fundamental way of seeing the world. Um, through having this this kind of necessity of subject. And honestly, when I try to even think about it differently, it's, it's impossible for me because I've just been conditioned and grown up since I was born to speak the languages and see the world in the languages that I know. Um, I don't know about the case for you, but the minds that I know of most people are the same. So it's just as I put forward a question, um, not necessarily needing an answer right now, forever of you know what what if the world that we see it as today and the languages that we speak were actually formed completely differently to be able to for example take into account the processes that we can't see happening but we know are there when it comes to describe the world expressing our view of the world as we see it um, that, you know, um, there was a lot of talk about dualism combined a binary structure and also a dichotomy. And I think that, like, at least in the humanities, we tend to speak like a hybrid, hybrid structure these days. And also, I think that that's, um, you know, corresponds with um, multilingualism and um, the last of the time. <laughs> Well, what I also think is is beautiful, you know, we talk about language and here we're kind of referring to to the spoken language that we're using right now. But it's also um, really important to think of it, you know, language is also, for example, music. Music is a language and color, pictures, art in that way is also a form of, of a language and expression. So I think it's it's beautiful that we have these complementary ways of expressing ourselves that don't actually always need words. Yes. Things that, like I explained with, for example, my experience of, of giving birth to my child, there are so many elements in there that language could never do it justice. You know, I can give you as many words as possible to try and explain that, but you weren't there to experience it. You didn't, I can't explain to you the sounds, I can't explain to you the, the smells, the imagery, it's like imagine me trying to 
if I were to ask somebody or I was trying to explain to somebody a color that they've never seen in the world, man, that would be a difficult task, right? It's so much easier to just show, hey, if they can see, of course, this is the color and we got it. Or same thing, if I told you to, um, to explain to me the taste of your favorite food, unless I have tasted that food, I will never be able to understand it. And so expression and understanding of the world doesn't just function through words and language amongst human beings. There are other realms as the ones that I mentioned that I think are, are really important to mention here as well. Okay, so are there any more questions? Okay, I'll, do, I'll just make one very quick comment before we move on that the idea of how language shapes the way in which we view things can also be seen at a, just a more sim simpler level. So for instance, in English, uh, one uh, says that, that I like something, but in many other European languages, it's very common to use another structure, which is in German, it's das gefällt mir, something is pleasing to me, or et mir neravitzer, that's pleasing to me, or questo mi piace, in Italian, that is pleasing to me. So again, it's just one example, but it shows that the, the way in which English looks at something that is the per somebody is doing the liking is different from other languages where something that focuses on the thing that is doing the pleasing. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, I think in the interest of uh, time, we will move on to the uh, next uh, um, speaker. But anyway, thank you, Lena, for a very wide uh, topic uh, and to touch on many points, not just language learning, but how language affects you, the way in which you know, we see the world as well. So thank, thanks again. Um, we'll move on to the next um, uh, presenter now. Uh, we have uh, Cesco Ariala, uh, Laura Meloni, and uh, Adriana uh, Georgieva, who will be talking about their Communicon uh, sort of, uh, system. So, yes, you are asked to do your present. You want to do your presentation in Italian or French. If it would be more effective, then you know, please go ahead and do so. I just have one request. I'll just stop recording now, and then I'd like to start recording again, if I may. So